Hey, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to the Community Cats podcast uh, and coronavirus pop-up panel. Today, we're focusing on spay neuter during COVID-19 and what that means. And we have a fantastic panel today, and it's great. Um, we have so much going on. I'm going to move really quickly here through a lot of things as folks get signed in. We already have 100 people signed in. Um, and so I'm going to just launch a couple of quick polls. Uh, before that, though, I want to do a big shout out and thank you to our four panelists that we have today that are going to share their thoughts and ideas with regards to um, spaying and neutering in this whole whole period of disease and pandemics. And first and foremost, I would like to say hope that everybody is healthy and um, doing well and all that stuff. So for our speakers today, we have... Um, Kathy Daniels, who is the CEO of Spay Illinois Pet Wellness Clinics. Uh, we have Jane Guillaume, who is the Executive Director for the People for Animals and Affordable Veterinary Care. We have Dr. Bob Whedon, who is a veterinarian as well as has an MPH. Uh, he's a community cat surgeon for TLC PetSnip and member of the board for the Alliance for Contraception and Cats and Dogs. And then we have Brian Cordes, who's the Director of National Programs for Neighborhood Cats. I'd like to thank all four of the panelists today for coming and sharing their thoughts. What we're gonna do, the structure for today, uh, quickly is also make sure, is everybody hearing and seeing me and seeing us? Just tell us if there's any technical questions going on and Kristen will tell me to stop. But um, we're gonna move right along because we have an incredible amount of content to get through today. So um, the speakers are going to present for about 10 or 15 minutes. We're going to move through all of the speakers. We'll collect Q&A questions in the questions box. And a thank you to Susie Richmond, who's helping with moderating those questions today. So as questions come up, do feel free to post those questions. We'll get them collected, and then we'll make sure we ask those questions at the end during the, the Q&A. I have a couple of quick poll, poll questions here for you. Um, one is... Um, I'm going to launch that quickly. Is your spay neuter clinic open? And it is, um, so you have a choice of yes, operating at full capacity. Yes, operating at partial capacity. Yes, only doing emergencies. Um, no spay neuter. And no, we're totally closed. So please do your voting so we can find out what's going on out there for the polls. Um, okay, so uh, only 3% are operating at full capacity. 18% are operating at partial capacity. 26% uh, are doing, or yes, but they're only doing um, surgeries, no spay neuter. No, 54%, no, we are totally closed. So this group wants to find out how to get back open again today. Have you instituted these measures at your clinics? Um, have you increased use of PPE? No public in the building, lower volume, reduced staff. You're allowed to choose as many, I think, of these as you want. Oh, but it says select one of the following. Oops, sorry. Um, if there are others, please put them in the Q&A just to let us know. But it looks like a lot of no public in the building. That was an easy fix. Um, and then reduce staff. Everybody's voting. Oh, the voting's really picked up. All right. So um, yes, people have increased PPE. No public in the building at 62% is the highest thing that everybody's done. Lower volume, 6%. Um, reduced staff, 13%, and then there's 7% in the others, so that'll be interesting. Let me see what the others have said. All of the above. Most of the others are all the all of the above realm, so, um, so that's great. I am going to introduce now um, Dr. Bob Whedon. Dr. Whedon kindly provided us with a couple of handouts, so on your control panel, you can go down. There's a couple of handouts there he may reference to, or you're free to download um, and take those home with you. All right, you look good. Thanks, Stacey. I appreciate uh, the intro and I appreciate this opportunity. Hello, everyone. Thanks for taking the time to join us. Um, on my screen right now is a uh, PowerPoint slide uh, that I'm gonna get to in a minute, but I first wanted to address a couple of things that Stacy talked about you know, one of one of which is, you know, what's the last month been like for our organization? And we almost immediately went to a non-contact approach uh, with drive-through check-in and discharge for owned animals. 
More recently, as the cases in our area continue to climb, we've stopped sterilizing owned animals. We did this to protect staff and, and other clients. Staff wear um, a mask, gown, and gloves at check-in and discharge. Uh, we've continued to sterilize feral cats, mainly because one trapper can transport a significant number of cats, thereby minimizing exposure to the staff uh, and other public. My focus is feral cat sterilization, and I've been I've been busy. Uh, uh, we're actually in the process of ramping up our feral cat sterilization. We lost one of our community partner agencies when they refused to pay their trapper. Uh, we were providing surgical services for them since they were short on veterinarians, but they uh, um, they they couldn't continue to pay their trapper. So uh, the trapper is actually now working with us. So we'll be ramping up uh, our feral cat surgeries uh, in the coming weeks. And you know, the question comes up because I, I've been pretty strongly advocating for continuing feral cat sterilization throughout this challenging time. And it seemed like all the national animal welfare organizations lined up. I jokingly referred to it like lemmings to the sea uh, in opposition of continuing sterilization surgery. Uh, but, you know, the vast majority of feral female cats that I've sterilized in the past month, month and a half, have been pregnant. And I feel that I'm fortunate to have been supported by TLC Pet Snip uh, here in, in Florida uh, in continuing feral cat sterilization. I shudder to think what would happen if we stopped. You know, there's going to be an explosion of kittens. Uh, one of the metrics that the Alliance for Contraception in Cats and Dogs looks at in its modeling project is the concept of preventable kitten deaths. And we know that 60 to 75% of feral kittens born do not survive to adulthood. I felt it was my place to do as much as I could to prevent these kittens from coming into the world in the first place. And of course, preventing more you know, in the future. I've been criticized for continuing surgery by those who believe that we should conserve PPE for human use. Well, my feeling is the amount of PPE consumed by TNVR programs is minuscule when compared to human needs. We reuse and relaunder caps and masks. Uh, we instituted an effective protocol to autoclave surgical gloves. And, and Stacy mentioned there's a uh, PDF of our protocol there, which I believe you can uh, download, uh, thereby extending their life. Um, I believe that we can minimize PPE use while still saving lives. And going forward, you know, I plan to continue sterilization of feral cats as long as the state of Florida and TLC Pet Snip will allow me to do so. We will continue to protect the public and staff by minimizing exposure. We will continue to conserve PPE to the extent possible. For those who do not have access to feral cat sterilization services, an alternative may exist in the short-term oral contraceptive magestrol acetate, and that's the slide on my screen. Um, you, can, you can go to the ACC and D website, acc-d.org, and there's a link um, to get more information, including a downloadable uh, PDF uh, position statement on this. Now, I'm not sure how practical this is going to be for truly feral cats because the recommendation is for cats that can be individually treated at prescribed times with an accurate dose and whose health can be monitored over time. There's been a lot of discussion about the use in feral cats by feral cat caretakers who maybe can meet you know, those criteria. So that's what I'm doing going forward. I'm going to stay as much as I can but there is an alternative uh, for uh, those who don't have access. So Stacy, I'll turn it back over to you.
There you are. Kathy Daniels, excellent. Thank you. Uh, Kathy Daniels, again, she's the uh, CEO for Spay Illinois, the pet wellness clinics, um, and she's actually squeezing us in during a clinic day here. So thank you so much, Kathy, for joining us and sharing with us how life has been for you and, and what you think about the future um, over the last, what, six weeks or so, and then what do you see happening going forward? There's been so much controversy with uh, the clinics, like Bob said, you know, we have a lot of people saying, why are you staying open? Why are you, you know, and we, we've had a lot of kickback, like, and some good, some bad with this. And we actually closed our clinic um, when the first stay-at-home order in Illinois was initiated on March 21st. And we um, reopened April 6th for rescues. Um, we closed at that time because everything was unknown, like so many other groups. We didn't know, you know, how are we going to do this? What are we going to do? And as I look back at that, um, I was, I kind of was sorry that we did close for that time because we did turn away a lot of our people that even needed vaccines, that rabies or puppy and kitten boosters, which were so important. Um, the last month for us has been chaotic. I can say I have not worked as hard as I've ever worked, I don't think. And that is just trying to put protocols in place um, as far as our curbside service, how we're going to see people. Um, we don't have anyone in the lobbies anymore. We have created um, protocol that allows our staff to call people ahead, email out our forms, our surgery forms, our um, contact forms, however we're going to do the service. We have someone standing outside our lobby for spay-neuter check-in. They will go to the car, check in the person, bring the information back um, to the CSR staff inside. Everything is done over the phone, and then we then go to the car and bring the pet in. Um, it's been really a hard process to get used to because really what we, we needed more staffing to do it, but we wanted to limit staffing. We have cut our surgeries in half, um, dropped down to one vet only, just so that we could even keep our staff exposure down. We have um, increased the number of spays that we are doing so that it lowers the number. And I don't want to say more bang for the buck of trying to sterilize the females before they're pregnant, but we were taking um, cats that were living in the same home. If there was a male female, we were taking in those cats versus a male cat just being in the house. We were really having to pick and choose. And we're still, we're still at that point where we're trying to maximize what we're doing, but with only being able to do half of the normal surgeries, we still can't, you know, reach everyone we need. And like Dr. Whedon has said, the week before we stopped surgeries, we had 11 to 15 in two days that were pregnant, pregnant cats and dogs. When we were closed, we had we called in a vet to come in and do that had nowhere else to go. Um, our feral cats, we have not, we were not seeing any of the feral cats. So then when we reopened our doors, everyone is pregnant. And it's really, you want to protect human life and you also want to do what we're supposed to be doing for our mission. I mean, to me, I was around 20 some years ago when we were still seeing all the bad, the euthanasia. So to me, that was a big part of why we needed to stay open, why we needed to continue, especially with the cat population and kitten season. So we just changed up our protocols. Nobody, you know, there is no contact. We um, are doing like Dr. Whedon said, reusing, um, autoclaving, our mask, our gloves, whatever we can do to save. Um, we've even cut back like on our alcohol because that was really, we, the alcohol, everybody needed alcohol. So we changed even our protocol using a chlorhexine um, 2% along with the 4%. So we changed up things like that. 
And I would be glad to share, too, anything that, you know, that we have that if anybody afterwards would like to email, I can share that with everyone. Um, continuing forward, I think that we're going to have to learn to operate like this for a very long, very long time. So I think it's going to become the new norm of what we're doing. But I also know that we're going to have to increase our surgeries back to 80 to 90 a day versus being at 35 where we're at. We're going to have to start operating like we've always done with a number of surgeries, but I do believe that we're going to have to stay with curbside service for quite a while. So I think we're every day things change. We say, okay, we're doing this better, or we could have been doing that better. And so I think that's kind of where we are today. We are going to have to learn to accommodate and to work with what we have. Um, I think that a lot of clinics, especially the smaller clinics, I think they're struggling. And I think that they're afraid how once they close, how are we going to open? Um, they're also afraid, like they're staffing. If we lose our staff now, are we going to get our staff back? And I think that is one of the biggest problems we're seeing on um, some of the groups that we belong to. The clinics really don't know what to do. And I think it's up to us that we're making it work right now to share with everybody. So I think having this um, podcast today, I think this is wonderful because everybody is up in the air. Nobody is doing right or wrong. We don't know what to do, really. We're just kind of all learning as we go along. So I think that we should just encourage others to, like, communicate and um, join some of the groups, even like this, where we can get it out there and we can help each other. Thank you, and I will turn it back over to you. Happy, thank you. Thank you so very much. Um, before we go on to Jane, I'm gonna do another poll for everybody just to gather some um, more information. Does your staff feel safe for those of you that are offering clinics? So we have 25% say yes, 25% say no, 49% say maybe, not sure. So um, that's an interesting statement. So there's a lot of uncertainty still out there. Um, and I think that we're all continuing learning how to try and best um, protect our staff. And it, but we also don't know a whole heck of a lot about the virus. So um, there's still a level of uncertainty out there. And I'm gonna do one more quick poll. Uh, okay, if you are doing sur surgeries, what uh, services are you offering? Emergencies only, spays only, neuters only, dentals, uh, other, put in the Q&A. And you can do one or more, check one or more of the following. So you can check more than one. Yeah, I heard somebody suggest that they were doing like low cost dentals because they felt they were helping the community. So that was an interesting suggestion. I'm sorry if the polls are going by too fast. I just want to make sure we have enough time for, for everything here. Uh, so 74% of uh, clinics that are open are doing emergencies only. Um, spays, 31% are doing spays only, neuters, 2% uh, dentals, and then there's uh, a couple of responses in the Q&A. Um, oh, orthopedics, wow. Okay, growth removals. And I see here, cat, neuter only before adoptions for shelter pets. So there's a shelter component in there. So now on to um, Jane Hume. Uh, she's the executive director of the People for Animals Affordable Veterinary Care. Uh, I'm gonna unmute you there. Okay, now you're unmuted. Are you there, Jane? I am. Super, excellent. All right, show is yours. All right, thank you so much, um, Stacey, for inviting me to to come on the podcast today. This is so important right now, and so many things are unsure, not only about the virus, but how do we um, take the time and, you know, from being stuck at home, as many of us are, um, to figure out how are we going to do what we do going forward, because so much of what we do is volume related. Um, so for my organization, People for Animals, um, we, like, uh, like Kathy, um, our governor, Murphy, issued stay-at-home orders on um, March 21st, and we decided to close. 
um, mostly because the volume, we just can't manage that many people. Sometimes we have 30 or more people in our waiting room at a time and a line going out the door, um, which we recognized was not safe for either our clients or our staff. Um, but the challenge that closing down has presented us is our business model depends on volume for sustainability. So, you know, we've taken the time um, while we've been home to try to figure out how can we do this more safely um, and when can we open back up again? So we've been watching what's going on in our community here in New Jersey. It's been a bit rough. Um, and, uh, you know, we've been struggling because um, PFA is, um, we don't have a huge endowment that we can kind of lay back and relax and know that we're going to get through this. We live day by day and anything that we can save, we pass that savings on to our clients. So we're, we're not sitting on a big bank account. <laughs> and this was very scary for us. Um, all of our employees had to be furloughed. Many are having trouble with unemployment claims because of just the volume that they're trying to, uh, to manage at the unemployment office. Um, and meanwhile, the organization is, is struggling financially as well. We have three clinics that we have to support. Our fixed costs for those three clinics are over $50,000 a month. With no revenue coming in, it's difficult. We've tried looking for grant, grants and government aid packages. Um, the government aid packages are confusing, they're hard to access, and the demand is um, hugely exceeding the funding across the board, so that's tough to come by. Grant funding that's available now is very limited and almost exclusively targeted to shelters, rescues, foster programs, um, and things like that, which is definitely needed right now. But um, unfortunately, the spay-neuter clinics are kind of left to find our own way through this crisis. Um, the only real, real option that we've had is to do fundraising, but in this age, that's also challenging. Fewer people can afford to give, and competition is stiff for the limited fundraising dollars that are available. Um, spay-neuter in general is harder to fundraise for in the first place because it's a preventative approach that requires um, a bit more understanding um, and it's a, a little more intangible, intangible to the donors rather than a cute little face um, that they can give to to save this particular animal. We're, we're, you know, we've struggled with this all along and I'm sure other spay neuter clinics have as well. You know, how do we get our message through? Um, so I'm going to move on to the next question in, in your um, list of questions, um, which is what are the issues that we've, um, that have kept us doing spay neuter? We haven't really um, continued with spay neuter. We did set up an email hotline so that we could keep in touch with our community and provide a resource to address urgent and emergency spay neuter needs like pyometras, pregnancies, testicular tumors, prostatic hypertrophy, things like that, things that were not routine spay neuter. Um, those things really couldn't, couldn't wait until we opened, so we did open one of our clinics just once a week to address those, um, those kinds of needs in our community. Um, we're also seeing urgent medical issues like abscesses, ear infections, allergies, things like that. Um, but we couldn't just shut down completely and leave our, um, our community unserved altogether. Um, we don't want to see those, those small medical problems turn into huge ones because they don't have any options of where to go. Um, we're already working now towards opening again for routine spay-neuter, hopefully in the first week of May. We are planning to prioritize shelters and TNR for all the reasons that everyone else has mentioned already, that you know we can get volumes of animals in with only one or two people interacting and keeping our staff safe. So. Um, my biggest concern looking forward though is there's there's absolutely no question in my mind that the need for affordable spay neuter and vet care is going to be overwhelming after this. So many people are on unemployment, um, you know, or can't get unemployment or have been laid off and things like that. It's just going to be long-standing um, effect economically um, for a lot of people out there. So it's really critical 
that we as spay neuter providers and affordable vet care providers find a way to do this. Um, and that's why I'm really happy that I was invited to be on the panel today. I'm looking forward to hearing other people's ideas and um, helping helping each other figure out how to how do we navigate this. This is all new to all of us. So thank you very much. Jane, thank you. Thank you so much for your thoughts and thank you for everything that you're doing um, for the cats and um, feral cats and, and everybody. And I, I really hope you make it through. Um, just for clarification purposes, you run more than one clinic, right? Right. We have three different locations and we cover the entire state of New Jersey. Excellent. And also, um, Dr. Whedon works for an organization that has multiple clinics. And I believe, Kathy, you can unmute yourself and tell me if I'm wrong, but you operate with one clinic, I think. We actually opened our second clinic last year at the end of all this, or at the beginning of all this. Um, it's a, a surgical center, and then we have a wellness center, so two clinics. Excellent. Thank you for the clarification on that. So you all have quite a bit, the organizations that you're involved with and that you run have quite a bit of overhead, that's for sure. And I'm not to knock the overhead that the shelters have. They certainly, humane societies and shelters have certainly overhead also. Um, but you definitely all have quite a bit of monthly overhead. So, Jane, thank you. And I, a lot of questions already building up in the Q&A, so we'll make sure we have time for that. If you want to close your camera down, and I will mute you. I'm going to unmute you. I unmuted you, Brian. Are you there? Okay, great. I'm here. Can you Excellent. hear me? Yeah, yes, great. yes, great. So you get to do cleanup here in, in the, our, our baseball theme of things. Uh, <laughs> since we have no baseball to watch these days. So uh, you're bad in cleanup here. And um, I'm wondering what your thoughts after hearing some of the comments from today are and going forward. Well, first, let me let me thank you, Stacey, for hosting this and for all the Community Cats podcast town halls and offering a forum uh, you know, that's so badly needed right now. So what I'd like to talk about today, I'd like to talk about three different um, ideas that are interrelated. Number one is, um, where are we today? Uh, number two is, how did we get here? And then finally, is this a good place to be? So let's start with, you know, where are we today? And I think uh, most of you, if not all of you out there, are, are acutely aware of what uh, the situation is, that we're in this Spain or shutdown where there are in many parts of the country, if not most, uh, no or few services available when it comes to Spain neuter. I mean, from the poll, it looks like 80% of the clinics that are attending today have no spay neuter um, services being offered. So this has resulted in, and we have shelters that are also um, not doing spay neuter. So we have animals that are being adopted out intact. We have uh, dogs and cats and other companion animals being placed in foster homes uh, unaltered. Uh, stray dogs and community cats are giving birth outdoors. And we also have no options available for pet owners whose um, pets are coming into sexual maturity and may start to be showing uh, spraying or going into heat, things like that. There's nowhere for them to go. So what are the consequences of this state of affairs um, if it continues? And, and I think a fair amount of damage has already been done, but let's say this goes on for months, if not longer. Well, we know that we're facing a, a surge in overpopulation. Uh, this could potentially add up na nationally to millions of cats and dogs. And that's not an exaggeration. We could basically undo uh, the progress we've made in uh, bringing overpopulation down over the last decade could be gone in a matter of six months. We've increased public health risks significantly. Uh, especially in areas that are dealing with rabies. So when we're talking about community cats and in some areas we're talking about uh, stray dogs, at the time of the spay-neuter surgery, that's when the rabies vaccination happens. So no spay-neuter, no rabies vaccination. We are um, potentially going to have a, a spike in rabies exposures and all the costs uh, that are associated with that, even if hopefully nobody dies from it. Uh, we also know that 
obviously nuisance behavior and quality of life issues are going to um, decline. That's why we do spay neuter. That's I'm a community cat person. When we have um, a hostile situation in a neighborhood, we try to fix the cats as quickly as possible because that reduces the hostility. If we can't do that, then that hostility is going to continue to rise. And I would expect that we're going to see a lot more cruelty incidents as well. Um, we're going to see a lot more abandonment. We're already seeing that uh, because, uh, again, as I say, pet owners have nowhere to go to, to solve the problems. And um, a lot of shelters are not taking in any animals right now, absent emergencies. Another thing that's not happening now, but is building up for the future, is obviously we're going to see a surge in intake, and that's going to lead to a surge in euthanasia. That means live release rates that we've fought so hard to bring up are going to start going back down. When we have increased euthanasia, we also have increased mental illness for shelter staff that is directly and regularly involved. That's been confirmed by uh, repeatedly by research that we see higher rates of suicide, higher rates of substance abuse, higher rates of post-traumatic stress disorder in shelter staff that is regularly exposed to euthanizing healthy animals. In impoverished areas where there are dog packs, we're going to see uh, larger dog packs uh, with more unneutered animals in them, making them even more dangerous. Obviously, there's just among the animals themselves, as long as this goes on, we're going to see more death, more suffering, and that causes trauma both to the caretakers of these animals and the owners. And then as you've heard today, from the people who are managing clinics, there's the financial stress, especially to a, a facilities that are exclusively spay neuter or you know almost exclusively spay neuter. Um, they have no revenue and uh, they're under tremendous financial stress right now. And if this continues, they may be out of uh, a fair number of them may be out of business. So this is this is pretty dire uh, circumstances that we're in right now. And I think we have to ask ourselves, how did we get here? Um, I, I think there are two main reasons. One, uh, which other panelists have alluded to, is just the shock, the shock of the pandemic. Uh, we were not prepared as a country, as a field, um, we, I think, believed this wasn't going to affect us, or if it did, it was going to be minimal. So it was quite a shock when all of a sudden uh, people started getting sick and the hospital started filling and people started dying. And uh, then these uh, shutdown orders just came down. And all of a sudden, I think it, it, it was such a, such a jolt to all of us, such, such an abrupt change of our normal lives that we, we just adopted a bunker mentality just to protect everybody as best we can as quickly as possible. And, and I think that's completely understandable. I, I do think that's starting to ease up as we start to realize that this could go on for a long time and it's just not sustainable to be uh, stay in the bunker the whole time. The other problem, or I would say the other reason that we are where we are today when it comes to spay neuter is that there was a coordinated and very intensive campaign by our leading uh, national animal welfare authorities, um, including respected spay neuter shelter veterinarians, uh, to shut everything down. And uh, I think uh, we, as a field, have always followed their lead and so continued to follow their lead. Their arguments were basically you can boil them down to three um, spay neuter is not essential. Uh, we should only be providing veterinary care for life-threatening conditions. Um, their other argument is that you are promoting the spread of the virus if you continue to do spay-neuter. And also the third argument is you're using a PPE, personal protective equipment that's needed in hospitals. So that, as I say, was quite an intensive campaign when these shutdown orders happened. And um, everybody being in shock, I think we just kind of naturally followed what we believe the experts um, were telling us. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this was not intended by the leaders of this campaign, but it turned out that in the aftermath, um, we've seen a fair amount of bullying on social media and stigmatizing organizations that have not 
gone along with the um, uh, what we're supposed to be doing according to these uh, experts. Okay, so finally, is this good policy? We know, we know what the consequences are. We know how we got here. Is this a good place to be? Um, I think it's a terrible policy. And I think the arguments that are being made in favor of this spay neuter shutdown are weak um, to be generous. So let's break it down. So we're being told that spay neuter is not an essential service. And what is essential really has two elements. There's a legal element, and then there's a value judgment. So number one, before you can go to a value judgment, you have to determine whether or not spay neuter is allowed, whether it's legal under the emergency rules in your jurisdiction if you're under a, sh a shutdown or a shelter in place um, emergency situation. So the, speaking as an attorney, if veterinary care is deemed essential, and in almost every emergency rules I've seen, there is a provision for veterinary care. If that emergency rule and the guidance that accompanies it does not expressly limit certain procedures, to, does not say only critical emergencies are essential veterinary care, if they don't say that, then yes, it is allowed, spay neuter is legal, if it is not, um, if uh, veterinary care is not defined otherwise. In most jurisdictions, it just says essential veterinary care, and it's left to the discretion of the agencies and the veterinarians to de determine for themselves what's essential and what's not. In New York State, the, uh, the uh, guidance for the emergency rules actually specifically says that spay neuter is considered essential veterinary care that is legally allowed to continue. So this is this is very much um, an issue you need to look at closely. Consult your attorneys. You're welcome to contact me, Brian, at neighborhoodcats.org. And I can't give you legal advice if you're outside New York, but I can point you in the right direction. But we know that um, spay neuter is still being performed in Texas and in New York and New Jersey, Florida, Oklahoma, Kentucky, Massachusetts. Illinois, uh, so just to name a few states. Uh, so um, my experience so far when I have looked at the emergency rules is that the vast majority of these situations um, do allow for spay neuter. They, it is legal, veterinary care, is essential veterinary care is not contrary to what the authors of this shutdown campaign would have you believe, it is not illegal in most jurisdictions that I've looked at to be doing spay neuter. So then we get to the second question. If it's legal, is it essential uh, in your opinion? And that's the point, it's your opinion. It becomes a value judgment about what's essential. If, it, if you are operating within the legal boundaries, then what you do within those boundaries is up to you. And um, so, some of our, as we've seen with this this campaign to uh, tell everybody, you know, you shouldn't be doing this. Some people believe that it is not essential. That's what they're telling. I mean, it's kind of this bizarre situation where our leading spay neuter experts are telling us spay neuter is an essential. Uh, that's their opinion, and they're entitled to that. But it's only their opinion. Um, my opinion is for all the reasons, all the consequences that we're suffering through now because this has shut down, that it's quite essential. Um, when we're talking about public health, when we're talking about people's mental health, when we're talking about um, overpopulation, when we're talking about euthanasia rates soaring, this, this is essential stuff. Um, and a lot of veterinarians and a lot of clinics that you're hearing today also agree and also think it's essential. And Another thing to look to is what are the private veterinarians in your area doing? Because another irony in this whole kind of strange situation is that the private veterinarians tend to take a much more liberal and a much more expansive view of what essential veterinary care is than the animal welfare field, or at least the, you know, our leading authorities. So uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I took my vet to, I took my cat to the vet to have a, a broken tooth removed. 
that was fine. That was perfectly legal um, because the veterinarian considered that to be essential veterinary care. So it's um, it's up to you. You need to decide whether you consider spay neuter essential, and if it's legal, then you're well within your rights to make that decision. All right, look at what's the other arguments that are being made uh, for why we should not be doing spay neuter as a field. Uh, the other one of the other three reasons is that well, you're spreading the virus if you're doing spay neuter. Now, I, I think that's kind of an extremist and very alarmist take on the situation because the the, the truth of the matter, the reality that we face now is that you're taking a risk of spreading the virus. If you walk out, if you open the front door, let alone walk out it, if you open the front door, you're taking a risk. So it's not really, the question is not really about avoiding all risk. That That is not possible during the pandemic. The question I think is about, can you mitigate this risk to the point where you consider that risk is, is acceptable? And the way we do that with spay and neuter is we do social distancing at drop off, um, at pickup, we do contactless payments, contactless uh, paperwork um, within the clinics. Uh, the, the, you know, we do as much distancing as possible. People are wearing masks um, and so forth. But the bottom line is, again, this is up to you. Uh, and, and your facility and you as a veterinarian as to whether or not you believe you can put procedures in place that will make this safe. Um, all right, how about using PPE? Again, I think that's a very personal um, organizational choice. You know, can you minimize the use of PPE? Can you substitute for it? Um, how badly is it needed in your area? Um, have the authorities been coming by asking you for it? Um, do you think the amount that you could contribute to your local hospital would be meaningful? Again, these are these. Can you reuse stuff like the uh, um, panelists have been talking about today? So again, this is this is your choice to make, and nobody is entitled to tell you that you are uh, killing healthcare workers if you're using PPE. That is just like so extreme, and you don't have to buy into that. Um, one of the things that's lacking right now that we're hearing today is that you know we need a guide on best practices, like how do you do social distancing in the clinics? How do you uh, minimize or substitute for use of PPE? So what we're doing at Neighborhood Cats is since, since the natural groups seem to have abdicated their role in all this, um, we're going to put a guide together. So if you have any protocols that are written out, um, please send them to us. We will uh, present them whole. Uh, and credit your organization if you would like or stay anonymous, it doesn't matter. But we're going to, by the end of this week, we will have a guide with whatever we've been able to gather so far and put that out there so you can see what other uh, providers are doing and then we'll update it as more information comes in. We're also going to put a tip sheet out on how to trap uh, safely and to um, maintain social distancing. So in the end, I think my message is that that you have to decide um, how important is the mission to your community. Um, you have to decide whether you can operate legally, safely, and, and in a way that's socially responsible. Um, and if you do, great, we need you, we really do, but you just, you do not have to follow leaders if you think they're taking you over a cliff. OK, it's important that if, if now if you decide it's not safe for your staff and, and I respect that, I'm not trying to bully anybody into doing anything. I'm just trying to open up the conversation about this so that people don't feel badly if they decide that they want to stay open and they can do it. Um, so it's important that we respect each other's choices either way. And, and, and this bullying and this ostracizing those who disagree with our so-called leaders, um, that has to stop. And I'd like to close by, um, if you'll indulge me, I'd like to read from a letter that Neighborhood Cats received uh, from a veterinarian who operates a small, a small spay neuter clinic in a poor uh, rural county in the South, because she, she can say it better than I can. Okay, several weeks ago, I too faced massive, almost paradigm shifting pressure to close amidst the pandemic. I watched webinar after webinar and literally felt overwhelming pressure and internal struggle 
with regard to all I was being told, and I saw the beginnings of the hateful posts on social media, which I avoided completely. After about a week of no sleep and very difficult soul searching, I elected to keep our little clinic open. Not one day has gone by since I regretted staying open. We are barely keeping the doors open financially, but here people are used to living on a shoestring. And I come from a family of hard workers, so we will get through this. I can't tell you the cases we have seen in the past month where I looked up at the staff from the surgery table multiple times in a day and said this, this cat's life, we just saved by doing this. This dog will never see a vet again after today. And we had this one chance to get it spayed. This, this pyometra, this torn uterus, this pregnancy that would have resulted in seven kittens next week. This is why we are here today. We too donated all the PPE that our local hospitals would take. And I kept one washable face mask, a washable cap, a washable gown and gloves that the hospital didn't want or need. Check-in takes five times longer. We have taken massive, massive precautions and we check people in one at a time at their car and on our porch and we bring the pet back. We start surgery later. We don't get to do our additional services as much as like yearlies and wellness exams. But right now we are open for business. It isn't fun, it isn't glamorous, it isn't efficient. And the days are so much more difficult during staff shortages and safety protocols but we are still open to spay and neuter and no pregnant emergency has been told no. Every day, I see the bitter, hateful posts by others who have never owned a business, managed a payroll, or more importantly, who have no personal bond with the area they serve. I love my staff, I cherish them. Anyone who didn't want to keep working did not have to, and they will be welcomed back when this is over. But meanwhile, the core of us persists, and we are there for these cats. We have come much, much too far in this county to stop now. Okay, that's that's a leader. That's somebody that I'd follow. Okay, thank you, Stacey. So at this point in time, thank you, Brian. I'm going to ask that the those that have webcams turn on their webcams. Excellent. Super. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for sharing your thoughts. Uh, questions, folks, please start sending in your questions. I've already uh, got some questions together. So I get, I've got some household questions. First and foremost, obviously, everybody in the world wants these magical protocols that are in the process of being written. So there's plenty of requests for that. Um, and Kathy, you had kindly offered to share, you know, what you know and what you are using. Um, are you willing to share your email address for folks to reach out to you to get the information that you have? Yes. Mm -hmm. Would you like me to type it in or just tell you? You can just tell us and then maybe oh, Kristen okay. can throw it in the, in the chat. She'll throw it in the chat. All right. It's the letter K Daniels at spayillinois.org. And Illinois is spelled out. And Brian, can you just share a little bit more about like this document? I'm assuming it's going to be an organic document. That's something that might not necessarily be frozen in time, but edited frequently. Is is that the plan? Yeah, that's the plan. I mean, I think what we're seeing is an immediate need uh, for this, and we don't want everybody reinventing the wheel. So we've reached out to those clinics that we know are operating and asked them to share their protocols. Uh, we think that by the end of the, this week, we'll have um, a, a, something to, to share with everyone. And we can, if you'd like to, Stacey, we'll share it with you to post on the community. So everybody can either go to the Community Cats podcast or go to neighborhoodcats.org and uh, that will be posted. We could also send it out to everybody who's attended today. So however you want to. Yep. We, um, we'd want um, to get it distributed as much as possible. Yeah, and yeah. Then, yeah, as as we learn more, we'll expand it. You know, we'll add because everybody's got different ways of doing things, but we just want people to have a starting point. Excellent. Um, another housekeeping item for uh, probably Jane and then also Kathy. Uh, Jane, I'll have you answer first. Someone's asking, going to the electronic paperwork, are you utilizing Clinic HQ or using DocuSign or or anything like that? Have you thought about that as you consider reopening? We actually um, already have a, a way of doing things online um, through free things. 
And um, we use Impromed software um, for our medical records. So they have a module on that, you know, allows remote, um, remote approval, signing of consents and things like that can all be done remotely. So we're taking advantage of that for sure. And what's the name of that software that you just mentioned? It's Impromed, I-M-P-R-O-M-E-D. Okay, excellent software. I know people will ask me that question, so I just want to make sure I have the right information there. Kathy, how do you guys do your paperwork? Right now, it's through email. Um, we are still having to have a signature on some because most of our clients don't have capabilities um, to get that paperwork. So um, we had looked at Clinic HQ, but since we run differently, how we operate with two different clinics and a wellness side and that, um, we looked into having our own program created so that we, it's kind of like the DocuSign, but it would be created for us. So we're still up in the air, but we know now because we do feel that this is going to be something that, you know, we're going to learn to live with, that we're going to go completely paperless that way. Uh, Dr. Whedon, do you happen to know how TLC does their paperwork and stuff? Um, no, I'm afraid I don't. That's a, <laughs> above my pay grade. You just you just get the cats, and do you know what to do with the That's cats? That's right. That's right. <laughs> just thought I would I would ask uh, next next one. I'll have Lisa on the next one. Okay. So, uh, Lisa, who runs the whole show over there, I had the privilege of meeting her uh, about oh about a month uh, five weeks ago, and it was great to to see your facility and, and everything there. Uh, and the other question that came out for those running clinics is, you know, how are you doing surgery in a socially distanced type environment? Um, so, it, Kathy, have you changed your surgical protocols for for that component? Um, we have in a way. We have, like I said, we've cut down to one vet. When we first started back, it was let's um, do large female dogs. And let's, you know, we started that way to see how can we keep people separated? Um, use the other clinic because I can have like a pod of people there that aren't with the other people. So if one of my vets gets sick, then we have, you know, backup. But we're we're slowly learning um, how to do it where we've added back in all animals, but it is really having one person for the surgery room, one or in the prep area and then your recovery and it's hard because our new clinic of course you want your prep and recovery everything close as can be so it's it's been a challenge everybody you know has to of course wear a face mask and everything but um we're learning as we go so far it's working pretty good for us um and we just keep increasing our numbers to see can we do this and still um be effective but be safe um and Dr. Whedon, how do things work with you on your feral cat days? Well, we're we're a uh, an ASPCA spay neuter alliance clinic, and and we follow their protocols for the most part. And and typically, we only have one surgeon operating. We have three tables so that we can keep significant amount of distance between the assistants and the surgeons. And there's somebody that's floating through, checking on the animals, and and our recovery area is right there as well, so they can also check on recovery. In, in prep, uh, typically with feral cats, you don't have somebody restraining and somebody uh, inducing. That's a one-person job. So in in prep, then we, uh, you know, they try to maintain social distance as well as everybody's wearing a mask. So. Um, it's really not a whole lot different than the way we did things, uh, you know, pre-coronavirus. You're just more protected from one another and more careful and if, about each other's yeah, interactions. We're, we're more conscious and conscientious um, of that social distancing. So, uh, uh, but the the way our clinic flows, it it it's it's not like we're bumping into one another. So we're fortunate in, in that respect. Have any of you had any experiences with um, a staff member getting sick with uh, coronavirus? Yes, <laughs> we had, but um, fortunately, 
we had closed down and she didn't get exposed while she was working. She actually was exposed from her mother. Um, so, so we had that. So, you know, to answer the question that, um, that the others commented on, our plan when we reopen, um, what you have to understand is one of our clinics is, is extremely busy. We have four surgeons working at a time. Um, and, you know, as you can imagine, the prep room is pretty crazy with all of the vet techs trying to get those animals prepped for four surgeons and keep an animal on the table. So one of our um, one of our strategies to limit potential exposure among staff, we're going to rotate our staff. We're going to cut down on the number of surgeons a day. We're going to have two instead of four, and we're going to um, cut our staffs our staff also in half, so that you know that we can keep you know group A together exposed you know to each other um, and group B separated. So it limits the number of, of people that they're gonna be exposed to while they're working. Um, I think the biggest challenge is gonna be restraining a dog for that um, initial knockdown. <laughs> um, so that you really can't do that with, with distance. So we're gonna be stressing time and minimize the amount of time that you are breathing in each other's face. Turn your heads away from each other um, make sure you're wearing your masks, things like that. And Jane, I think, I'm sorry, Stacey, I think that is a concern too. And what I've talked with my staff and what we look at it, like when we go to the grocery store, if you think the cashiers, I mean, they're seeing hundreds of people every day and we're trying to be as safe as we can. Restraining that dog or that cat, you know, if you have a fractious cat, that's not a feral and, you're going to you're going to get close there's going to be and we understand that but we don't feel like we're putting us our staff doesn't feel like they're at any more risk than we are going to the grocery store and right up with the cashiers and going through we are okay with this and i mean my staff that's that's the backbone of this clinic and they had to be okay for us to stay open. Some didn't come back and that's why you know what that's why i'm working. I work there too. We all help but your staff has to be okay and they have to know there's going to be some closeness too. But I, we look at it as we're just as going to be exposed at a grocery store. So, and here we're saving lives. The people at the grocery store are saving our lives because we have to eat. We need supplies. So we kind of look at it that way. Um, and so sort of in that same vein, there's another question about, you know, how would you intubate a cat? Um, without having staff closed. So it's it's going back to that question of minimizing, I would assume, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, our techs can intubate a cat with one one person, but you're going to get a fractious cat sometimes and you're, you know, before you're going to need help. Same thing with a dog. So it's it's like Jane said, though, turn your head, keep, you know, but you do have to keep a visual. So it's not like we can really turn away from this animal. You know, it takes two sometimes. We have and another problem we've seen, we're all dressed up in masks and everything. We're scaring these animals to death. Try to get them, you know, curbside out of the car. I understand their fear. I'm out there going, oh, my gosh, poor baby, poor, you know, because I understand. So this is a new world, and we're all going to have to get used to it, too. And we're going to have to adjust. I mean, I can just imagine the fear like the cats when we open up the carrier to take them out to weigh them, exam them. We're scaring them to death. But, I mean, it's a new way of operating. My question for the, the group, Russ, most particularly Kathy and Jane, as you run clinics is, um, you know, the clinic uh, structure is so revenue generation based and we've had this model created for us. This is the perfect magical model. You, you'll be able to run on your service fees and, um, you know, not necessarily have to do a ton of fundraising to be able to pay the light bill and the staff and all of that. Um, this business model, is going to change probably for at least the next two years or until a vaccine is developed and implemented and that could be up to even i've heard four years as of today so um are you running like business models trying to figure out what your budgets are going to look like over the next year or so anticipating this sort of different lifestyle i don't know jane if you want to dive into that one first or <laughs> yeah. that's a loaded question stacy <laughs> um 
I think I think realistically it's hard to do that right now. Are we are we trying to plan ahead and forecast? Absolutely. You can't run a business without doing that. But I think that we need to be flexible. We need to be open to new ideas, new ways of serving the clients. And you know, for me, the volume is not just about us staying financially solvent. It's about solving the problem in the community. So it's really critical that we find a way to do this safely and effectively and still be able to serve the volumes of, of um, animals that we have been in the past. Kathy, do you have um, any thoughts on that? Yes, our model is has changed drastically because 25% of our revenue was from our off-site vaccine clinics where we go out into 14 different towns and cities every month hold vaccine clinics. Um, it gives us the ability to get people to see who we are, want to get them on our transport program and reach the ones in need, but it's also revenue. So those have been closed. I don't think they're going to open up this year. And so we are changing. Now, anybody who knows me and hopefully nobody's going to comment on this, I'm a control freak. So this unknown is killing me. I, I am really stressing. Um, I try every day, what can we do to keep this going? What can I do to maintain those free surgeries for those who need it? I don't want to turn people away. Um, how can we, you know, be most effective so we don't have all these kittens born? Like, it, I almost feel like I'm forced to pick and choose right now, and that has to stop. You know, like, I've talked to my staff, we are going to come to a decision, and this is how we're going to operate. And by June, we plan on two vets, 80 surgeries a day. We plan to be there but it's, it's the unknown. Most clinics, I think, are terrified now. I mean, like Brian had said, and that's part of the reason I usually don't jump on these. I'm so busy, but one of the groups I'm an admin on, one of the girls from a small clinic had said she felt bullied by the leaders. And I was like, you shouldn't feel that way. We should be like helping these people. And I think that we're all going to have to operate differently, but as a service fee revenue based, we're going to have to do a lot of strategy here because there's no way that we're going to be able to afford our programs if we cannot do the volume, like Jane said, and bring in the numbers too. Hey, Stacy, just yep. a couple of quick, quick, couple of quick comments on that. Um, one is that, uh, you know, one of the things that's being a uh, promoted with by, by the organizations and the individuals who are telling everybody they should shut down is this notion that um, you know you all need to stay safe and healthy because when this ends uh, we're all sitting around you know the higher ups are sitting around talking about all this 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 gigantic amount of funding that's going to be devoted to spay neuter and that we're going to come back bigger and better than ever and the typical slide that's shown when this is being told is this neuter clinic in Puerto Rico where 700 animals were fixed in a day. So that's completely unrealistic in my, in my view. Um, number one, we're not going to be having any large gatherings anywhere, let alone on mass spay-neuter days. And also this isn't, that, that, that picture is a scenario where one day this is over and then we're back to normal and we open up the clinics this is going to be a gradual process where we we slowly kind of feel our way towards what is safe. We take some steps forward, we take some steps backwards, but it's it's going to be a bumpy road for all of society as it, we try to reopen and 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 restart our economy and um, start to provide spay neuter. So there isn't going to be a day when all of a sudden we're all free and they can shower all this money on us. The clinics. The shelters, they need the money now, okay? They aren't going to be here for this big bang if you don't support them now. And that money that you're setting aside needs to go into grant programs to support these clinics now. Part of it is just keeping the doors open. Part of it is helping them to diversify their services. Uh, an x-ray machine, a blood testing machine will allow them to generate other sources of revenue. The other thing I'd like to say is I've always felt that the spay neuter clinics have missed an opportunity um, when it comes to direct mail and when it comes to email marketing because they have like great lists. Uh, all these people who are coming in and using your services are 
uh, in fundraising terms, those are those are great prospects that you're going to get a high rate of return on. But um, spay neuter clinics have been so focused on self uh, funding themselves that generally they have not gone into this. So um, uh, we did a, a podcast on how to write an email appeal that is up on the Community Cats podcast website. So I would encourage people to to watch that and also. Um, so we don't pretend to be the ultimate experts at email and direct marketing, but that's a lot of what Neighborhood Cats does to raise funds. So if you want help getting started with that, we can point you to the right firms. We can coach you on the appeals and just get you started down that road because you have valuable assets that you're not using right now. Excellent. Um, Dr. Whedon, I, have a, I want you to put on your uh, public health hat, all right? Um, okay. At the I think we should have a public health question uh, before we wrap up. And, uh, you know, I, I think that's one of those things that helps encourage our sort of battle or, you know, going forward, why it's so critical. There's the spay neuter component, the population, uh, you know, overpopulation issue, but there's also the rabies. And I always fall back on that rabies issue, the vaccinate issue. And um, you're the first one to go out and say TNVR all the time, the importance of that V. And I think that maybe should be a big part of our um, justification for trying to keep these services open, because this is a way of getting a large proportion of our population vaccinated out there for the feral cats and, and that community. Um, I would assume you would agree with that. Is that a, a tack for us to take when we're talking in general with others about why is it so important for us to open up? We want to get those rabies vaccines out there and in the population. Absolutely, Stacy. I've been advocating for years now that we refer to TNR as TNVR. I mean, most clinics are vaccinating anyway. Why don't we promote the fact that we're doing that? Because in doing so, we engage a whole separate group of stakeholders, the public health community. And it, it you don't have to be an expert in epidemiology to understand the concept of herd immunity. You know, you don't have to vaccinate every cat in a uh, a community or every cat in in a, uh, a a neighborhood to significantly protect everybody because of the concept of herd immunity, and and what you're doing is creating a barrier to the disease between wildlife and pets and people, and, and so yes, I've argued for for years that that rabies should rabies vaccination should be um, part of TNVR. And not only should it be, but we should be promoting that because that gets people's attention um, when you're lobbying in a community uh, to establish a TNVR program to reduce the number of cats that are killed in shelters. Yeah, it's it's all well and good to say, yes, we're going to save cats lives. But by promoting the public health aspect of it, by creating the barrier to that zoonotic disease between domestic animals and, and pets and people, that gets the attention of a whole different group of stakeholders. So absolutely, I agree, we should be promoting it and doing it. Excellent, excellent. Well, it's a little bit after five o'clock. Um, I'm gonna do one last poll for the folks that are here. Um, and this is gonna be the toughest question of the day for those of you that do have uh, spay neuter clinics that are here. So the question is, will you financially survive this? Yes, I'm sure we will make it. Uh, yes, but it'll be a real struggle. And no, we most likely will close. So excellent, excellent. We asked this question on, on Saturday too. So we were, uh, I'm gonna close the poll real quick and share the results. And so 53%, yes, sure, we're gonna make it. Yes, 47, yes, but it'll be a real struggle. And no, we'll most likely have to close as a 0%. So this is a great group. Congratulations on um, on the financial. It's gonna be a struggle, I understand, but at least you're gonna make it. So that is very good news. Our, our group on Saturday was not looking quite as happy. So um, that's... That's too bad. Oh, look at Dr. Weed's dog. Oh. This is Dee Dee. Dee Dee says hi. 
Dee Dee says it's it's dinner time. So oh, she's reminding me. My goodness, my goodness. All right, so um, Dr. Whedon, is it okay if people follow up with questions to you all directly sure. as I pour through these? Because sure, I'll get these questions. We'll get them out to you. Um, there are several other questions I've sort of themed things through. This will be recorded. It will be on the YouTube page. Email me at Stacy at communitycatspodcast.com. If you have any questions, our next pop-up panel is going to be Saturday, the 25th um, at 2 p.m. Eastern time. And we have, uh, uh, my list is missing here. Ruth, uh, Stein, uh, Ruth Steinberger is on for Saturday, and I'm getting a few other people on for Saturday. And then Monday at 4 p.m. on the 27th will be Dr. Jeff Young, Dr. Sarah Pisano, and To Be Determined. So I'm still putting the list together. So mark your calendars. You can register for those at the communitycatspodcast.com website. Um, and we have a whole slew of other educational activities going on there. And so feel free to check it out. And um, Terry Kidd is saying, hi, Bob and Dee Dee. So... <laughs> <laughs> out there and everybody's saying great job thank you thank you on the question so i appreciate everybody kathy thank you so much and uh i hope you all have a good night send your suggestions in all that stuff we'll see you all next week thank Thanks, you Stacey. Stacey. Bye. bye thanks